you have the whole script with Okay, so I'm going to copy paste it from the So you did, you did also meant to get this back image into Teams. Willem or Klaus, could you say something to test the audio? Yes, we are here. I'm here as well. Can you hear us? Perfect, thank you.
Okay. Welcome uh, to this session on um, opportunities for interdisciplinary interoperability. It's one of the two sessions on interoperability that we have today. Um, from the name you can perhaps guess that we will be looking more specifically at how interoperability plays a role between, um, let's say, um, infrastructures from uh, different uh, communities. These are the uh, <coughs> presenters. So my name is Dan Bruder, and I'm affiliated with the uh, with the Clarion Eric, and I will introduce the other speakers uh, shortly when their turn comes on. This is the program. So I'll give an introduction. It's not a very short introduction, but uh, I hope it's not too long either. Um, then we have a presentation on the conversion hub. Um, but I'll leave it to uh, the presenters to explain a bit about uh, their um, uh, activities in shock themselves. And then uh, at the end of the session, I hope that we have sufficient time left to have a proper discussion, counting on at least 15 minutes. Um, not that that's enough to discuss all the intricacies of, of the, uh, the, the challenge at hand, but. Uh, it should allow for some interesting uh, exchanges. So let me start with the introduction. Um, so I'm an infrastructure builder, uh, not programming myself, but uh, working with concepts. Um, and interoperability plays a huge role in infrastructure. So um, if you look at the, uh, the there are big numbers of uh, um, definitions for what is interoperability, but it's not interesting for the matter of hand. I would say for the work that we have done within SHOCK and uh, which we are going to discuss today, what's uh, a sufficient definition is that interoperability is the ability for different research infrastructure components to be easily connected and exchange information. And it's, uh, um, it comes back, interoperability all the time. Uh, think of exchanging and using data and metadata. I mean, this, this problem of the catalogs that somehow have to be made interoperable was already mentioned in previous session this morning. Think also about referencing and accessing data, so citation, the use of persistent identifiers, AI, not to forget, processing and analyzing data. And I know it's usual if you read in the books about interoperability that you uh, uh, classify it into what do you have, te technical, structural, semantics, legal, organizational. And this is all very important. Uh, and the work that we do touches upon all of these, uh, these aspects, but it's not useful to go very deep into this uh, uh, distinction. Um, those who work <laughs> on interoperability, they know that it's not trivial to maintain interoperability within a single organization. So looking at infrastructures, research infrastructures, the challenge gets, of course, not smaller, but bigger, right? Why interoperability and uh, why work towards uh, interdisciplinary interoperability? Well, there are a number of reasons you can think of. Efficient data creation, processing and analysis by using combination of intero interoperable components. Because uh, on the other side, you can build, of course, big monolithic applications that uh, don't need to be interoperable with the world. They are internally interoperability because that was how they were designed. Personally, I don't think this is a good, uh, good idea because it uh, makes things more expensive and things do not become exchangeable there. It reminds me a bit about what they said in the last century about interoperability. If you buy Microsoft, you're always interoperable, right? But that's not something we want. Okay, interoperability also offers possibilities for sharing and reusing data and sharing services across communities. And it's nice because it gives scaling advantages. And it's also nice because I think it makes interdisciplinary research more easy. How do we realize interdisciplinary interoperability? Well, you have the, the, standard, the standards way, the standard standards way, I would say, uh, using standards common recommendation. But I think 
all of you who have tried this will know that what you face is also existing entrenched practices and ideas. And uh, even if the community is wrong, <laughs> so you might think you know better, uh, it will prove difficult to uh, convince. And it's, uh, it's a real challenge. But there are also real problems, I think. Uh, there is, I, still, I think, still this, um, how do you say that, uh, this, this stream, this, this initiative to f solve interoperability problems by providing one metadata set, one ontology, one big vocabulary, and uh, yeah, those who have tried to do or, or worked to try to do that will know that it's really very challenging and very expensive to do so. So there, I would say, and that's something we have done in, uh, ta in work package three of uh, shock. Uh, there we want to do uh, pragmatic conversions, conversions that are needed to achieve a certain goal, but not more than that. Then there is also the possibility of common service development, so uh, or select existing services that, uh, with a little tinkering, might uh, be made into covering a wider scope than just the community in which they were uh, created. Uh, working in that way, uh, for instance, uh, uh, making the tools support uh, different uh, uh, metadata sets and uh, support a um, uh, sufficient number of data formats beyond the original data format for which it was designed. Most important is, I think, that common services, if, if, if we have them, if they are found useful by the researchers, they will also motivate further alignment of practices and stop fragmentation into different, using different tools and different practices. But, and that's, that's I think the mo most important, it's not an automatic process. Uh, you have to do a lot of market research and I call that talking to researchers and uh, uh, talking long, uh, <laughs> doing many interviews with researchers to find out what they, uh, what they really need. And uh, yeah, you have to even evangelize. And that's not making just a, a folder. Uh, it's, it, means, it means going out there, talking to the researchers, and making sure that what you have designed works or doesn't work, and then you go back to the drawing board. This is pretty expensive, but I think it's worth to do it, to have personal contact with the researchers instead of working through just writing the documentation. Between us, and us stands for us and the SSH, but you had caught that, of course, <laughs> right? Uh, I think a shock in shock, uh, we have three data domains, and this is a concept that's not from me, from Clarin, but it's something that was, uh, I think, uh, uh, conceived in, in Daria. At first I thought, I don't like it, but it fits, it fits what I want to tell here, so I reuse it. Thank you, Stefan, if you're listening in. Um, so what does it mean, these different data domains? It doesn't mean that data in the Daria domains is red or data in the Clarion domain um, has a flower odor. No, it means that there, with the data domain there is a whole set of expectations and way of doing things and set of tools that are connected to this data domain. Right? And within uh, Shock, what we have tried to do is uh, overcome the separations between data domains. For instance, by the Virtual Collection Registry, which uh, 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 will be uh, presented later on, uh, which allows creation of uh, research collections that are distributed over different data domains, with the switchboard, which allows users to invoke services on resources that are hosted by other data, uh, data domains, and by the conversion hub. But as I said, sometimes you have to be practical, and there is no other way than just converting one metadata format or data format into the other. EOSC and ASH. Um, EOSC initiative is running in parallel with us. You have heard already about that in previous uh, um, uh, 
come together, so that's shock organized. And uh, also this morning again in some of the uh, presentations. Um, so similar considerations that pertain to interoperability within the SSH itself, of course, pertain to research in general. And um, yeah, there too, advantages can be made by uh, creating things in interoperable, interoperable ways. There, I think, for as far as I see what's going on in EOSC, EOSC the EOSC infra projects are, can be helpful in facilitating interoperability discussions and implementations. So don't see EOSC only as the core services that let's say provide uh, services to uh, the services of thematic services from the different uh, communities, but also try to see EOSC as a potential uh, provider of um, uh, services that can support interoperability between the disciplines. Think for instance of a metadata registry which you can use to find out what is now exactly the schema of the neighboring um, uh, discipline. Are there any semantic mappings available that would help me uh, mapping my metadata into the other metadata set? These are things that are currently under consideration of um, some of the projects that are running or that will run shortly. So for instance, uh, EOSC uh, has now launched the idea is not implemented yet of the interoperability framework. And we as communities have to simply make sure that it also serves our purpose of uh, interoperability between the disciplines. Uh, the really new project will start that will make a registry for uh, metadata schemas and semantic mappings in between. And the last thing I think, but I'm not sure how they will do that. Uh, I think EOS can help us to find a model and the instrument to provision these uh, services to others. Uh, do that in a sustainable way. And then I mean having economic uh, uh, compensation for, uh, for doing that. There are different models and strategies possible, I think. And we should make sure as communities that we play a role in those discussions. Okay, some final comments, but you had, I think you had already understood that. So it's not only a matter of technical solutions, but what we need is also cluster governance that supports such work. And there, I think the memorandum of understanding that was already mentioned this morning, which kind of covers the future collaboration between the, uh, the shock partners is, uh, how do you say? Lo especially loosely formulated to support such continuing uh, work. Uh, and we need continuing expert discussions and the discussion infra, decision infrastructures. And yeah, funding, so either from uh, shock-like projects or uh, otherwise in kind. We did that in the past and it, um, it covered uh, some of our needs, not all, but certainly something that will continue. Um, within shock, we have addressed interoperability in many uh, of, our, of our tasks. Some of them will uh, be presented uh, now, others in the um, uh, session, uh, the other uh, interoperability session after this. So with this, uh, I end my introduction. And I think now it's the turn of uh, Mari Klimela, who was in Word Package 3, leader of tasks. What was it, Mari? I've almost forgotten already. 3.5, right? The confer the interoperability slash conversion hub. So Mari is from the University of Tampere. And uh, well. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's try this. Uh, so my presentation today is uh, about the results of task 3.5 that was called Data and Metadata Interoperability Hub. Uh, and I will walk you uh, shortly through uh, what we've done during the project uh, and the major things. 
So I, I, I want to start with uh, what we started with, so looking at the metadata and data format landscape, and based on that we made some metadata recommendations in our first deliverable. Then we started working on this conversion hub, uh, that I will show a little bit more in the later slides. Uh, and, and we have the deliverables and the milestones, you can go and read them uh, on the SOC website. Uh, we also developed some format conversion solutions, and uh, actually this is work that is st still ongoing. We still have, uh, well, um, almost a month to go, so a lot of things to do still. Uh, uh, other things that are still ongoing uh, is editorial work on the conversion hub, so that, that's something that uh, there's actually quite a lot to do to polish and tidy up the content so that it will be really up to date before we end the project. Uh, and, and we are also working on vocabulary commons in TAS 3.5 and Matei will tell more about that. It's, it's not only TAS 3.5, it's uh, wider. And you can see the list of partners there. Uh, so this was quite a var varied group from different organizations particip participating in participating in shock and I think it's been a learning uh, experience because we didn't really know each other that well before we started the project and I think that's one of the uh, outcomes of the project is also this networking and learning to understand uh, people from different domains. So I mentioned that uh, the metadata standards and our recommendations so we did, uh, in the very beginning of the project, we interviewed uh, 16 uh, experts, metadata experts from different domains and uh, infrastructures. And this is the table uh, that is the outcome of that. So we are sort of saying that uh, uh, everybody should do and could do, should be able to use uh, common metadata formats like Dublin Core or relaxed data site. And relaxed here means that we don't really like the, uh, that, uh, the DOI is the obligatory PID uh, when you are using data site. We understand why it is, but it's uh, not something we want to recommend. So uh, there are, also, of course, others. So um, we haven't updated the recommendation as such, uh, but other things are happening. So uh, DCAT AP, I think, is something that's coming up uh, more frequently. Uh, open air, which is basically the same as data site with a little bit different uh, uh, requirements or recommendations or mandatory elements. And uh, of course, uh, schema.org, I think, is something that everybody seems to be mapping their stuff now. Uh, then we have these recommendations for different uh, communities or domains. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's a variety of metadata standards. In the interviews, uh, I think 19 metadata standards were explicitly meant, mentioned as being used. So uh, while 19 uh, doesn't sound much, but actually it is uh, quite a lot of standards to work with. Uh, even when we asked for the two most important metadata standards, they still gave 11 different ones. So. So I, I think this also speaks for the thing that there's, uh, there's a need for this diversity of standards. There are different use cases for these standards and it's uh, naive to expect that uh, everybody could somehow use the same one. On the discoverability level, uh, sure. Uh, so Dublin Core kind of uh, 10 elements, that's usually something that everybody will have. So based on this uh, diversity uh, and, and, and the, the conclusion that this is something we need to accept uh, uh, and uh, we, we came up with this conversion hub idea so that researchers that are doing cross-disciplinary research could uh, have a place where they could look for and find reliable, reliable information on existing uh, conversion solutions. So we did an inventory, uh, desk research, looked for all kinds of solutions, and uh, the, the, uh, you can go to the conversion hub and see there are 46 solutions currently, uh, and each solution is described like this. So it's not very fancy looking, uh, but it's the basic information, and this is based on the data model that we uh, developed in uh, task 3.0. Five, uh, and it's mapped to the open 
uh, marketplace and it's also mapped to schema.org and uh, SOC Grow. So we were not trying to invent something new uh, that would only apply to our conversion hub uh, because there are already enough data models and metadata formats. So its, it's solution is described uh, and that's, uh, that has been done by the editorial team in, in our task. So, so as I mentioned, we have 46 solutions uh, at the moment and the number is uh, quite different from community to community and I think it reflects the people uh, in our team, basically. Uh, and, and we also gave priority to solutions that are relevant for several sub communities or for cross community use, and, uh, and also the solutions that uh, dealt with the recommended formats. Uh, I, I, I would say that most of the solutions that are there and are listed in our conversion hub, they actually require an advanced or expert level of knowledge before they can be used. So this is not a trivial thing where researcher can go and find a solution and just use it. Uh, in, in most cases, they probably need a lot of information and knowledge about the metadata standard, for example. If you are a social scientist, you probably need to know DDI if you want to use a conversion a solution or, or mapping. And uh, that's probably not something that researchers are really uh, into. Uh, maybe that's not their expertise area, so it's also for the infrastructures uh, to make this easier so, so, and, and to reduce these barriers. Uh, in some cases, we think that adding just documentation would be sufficient, uh, but uh, some solutions are, could also be candidates for developing into some sort of easy-to-use web services, but that was out of scope of our task in this project. Uh, and, and, I might add that we did find out that uh, in many cases licenses and ownership of so these solutions was not clearly stated, so it was very unclear who can use, how we can use them, especially if we want to use them as infrastructures. Uh, of course, individual researchers could use them. So the technology, uh, it, it runs on Drupal 9. And there were a lot of considerations that were taken into account when choosing this. Uh, and and the, we wanted to have something that would enable a good search and discovery, uh, but also easy editing uh, for the curational team. And, and all this has been described in our deliverable 3.6, uh, a lot of details there. So if you are interested, that's the, that's the read, uh, must read for you. Uh, and then we have also thought about using by external services like the open marketplace. So there's a connection there. Uh, I want to end this uh, with a few words about the sustainability. Uh, so in deliverable 3.6, we proposed a few scenarios for the conversion hub. Uh, and, and we know that the costs will increase the more you want to do. Uh, but it's also true that uh, if you don't do anything, it will die. Um, at the moment, we know that uh, two years after the project, this will be in good hands. So ACDH uh, will be hosting the technology and SESTA will be the, in charge of the editorial work. Uh, and that's two years after the project. We've also created some in individual conversion solutions. And this is thought that this is the um, the developing organizations will sustain them after the project. So, for example, uh, our colleagues from Sweden, SND, uh, have been working on, on these uh, mappings and, and style sheets for metadata format conversions. So, this is clearly a beginning, and this is a very small brick, uh, uh, building brick in, in all the interoperability framework. And uh, Generally speaking, there are a lot of mappings between metadata formats and, and, and a huge number, and many of them are in spreadsheet tables, um, but not, uh, there are not that many ready-to-use conversion services, and actually the uh, conversion hub is not that either. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done to ease the life of the researchers, especially researchers doing cross-disciplinary uh, work. And then I, I think uh, maybe the lack or shortage of available conversion services 
Uh, maybe it results partly from lack of collaboration between infrastructures, uh, but also, I mean, maybe the researchers are just doing them case by case, which is not necessarily optimal. So there's more to read uh, in these deliverables and milestones. And with that, I conclude my presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Mari. And the next two presenters are virtual presenters from remote. Uh, so I hope you can link them in now. So first one will be uh, Willem, I think. And Willem yes. is Can you a hear me? software and product developer at Clarin Eric. And Willem has, uh, let's say, doing wonderful things with some tools. Go ahead, Willem. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, fine. OK, yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, for this session, I will be talking a little bit about the virtual collection registry and all the developments that we did within Shock regarding uh, the improvements uh, for interoperability. Uh, let's. I will start with a short overview uh, explaining um, what a virtual collection is. So a virtual collection basically is a set of links to objects uh, accessible uh, via URLs on the, uh, in, in, in data repositories. They can point to any data object. It can be text, it can be audio, it can be video. And by creating a virtual collection, uh, you can group uh, coherent uh, resources and make them uh, easily accessible via the virtual collection registry and easily citable because they get assigned uh, persistent identifiers. Um, the links that a collection is pointing to can originate from uh, different archives. Um, and in that sense, a virtual collection can provide a neutral ground uh, across different ar archives. And that's also why we call them virtual. Um, the collections can be manually accessed via your web browser in the virtual collection registry, but they can also be automatically processed uh, by software. Um, all the metadata is exposed over OEI PMH and is easily harvestable. There's an API, so you can also interact uh, with the virtual collections uh, via this API. Uh, the virtual collection registry is a service offered by Clarin Eric. And it's basically the tool that we developed to uh, create and manage these collections. And I will show a short demonstration later on. The virtual collections um, use uh, an access model. So by default, when you start to create a collection, the collection is private. And th this means that it's not publicly accessible uh, as long as you're working on the collection. At some point, uh, you're finished uh, working on the collection, and at that point, you can publish the collection. Um, the process of publishing a collection will also mean um, that this collection gets assigned a PID. At the moment, we are supporting handles and DUIs. So every collection that you publish in the virtual collection registry is citable uh, with a DUI. To be able to manage your collections, you have to authenticate. And at the moment, we are supporting most of ADGAIN IDPs. And if you do not have access to, uh, to uh, a valid IDP identity provider, you can always create a Clarin account and, and use the Clarin identity provider. Um, after successfully authenticating into the virtual collection registry, uh, you can perform all the actions that are required to, to manage your collection. Um, you can publish it uh, when you're finished. Um, one remark at the moment, it is uh, discouraged to edit collections after they have been published, since there's this expectation that they should remain stable. And that's something to keep in mind. Within the shock project, we've had uh, various discussions with communities to discuss use cases uh, of the virtual collection registry and virtual collections within that community. Um, one of the things, one of the scenarios that came up was 
to use the virtual collections from uh, the data repositories uh, that, that are used within these communities. So we've worked with Daria and Sesta uh, and Clarinda, which we are part of, to integrate the virtual collection registry with various uh, data catalogs. Uh, this basically means that within the data catalog, within the data repository, you can perform a search and based on the results, you can make a selection and add the results uh, to a collection. And you can do this in multiple repositories and combine all these results in a single collection. That's, this is also something that I will demonstrate uh, in, a, in a short while. If you have created a collection, you can use the collection to um, send it, for example, to the switchboard. Uh, at the moment, we are supporting uh, to send a single resource of a collection to the switchboard. After the shock conference, uh, quite soon, there will be support to send an entire collection to the switchboard. And after sending a, a single resource or a complete collection to the switchboard, the switchboard will, will give you a suggestion on, on tools that you can use to process the resource or to process the collection. Another integration that, that has been developed in the shock project is the integration with the CMDI Explorer, which you can use to download a collection. Um, so by using this functionality, you will send the, the metadata of the collection to the CMDI Explorer and that will do the analysis of the collection and, and collect all the resources for you to download. Uh, Klaus will explain a bit more about this. Uh, Dan also asked to prepare a short demonstration about uh, showing how, how all this works in, in, in reality. So we made this uh, demonstration uh, around a scenario where there's a researcher who's interested in creating a collection uh, of Germanic languages. And he's, the researcher is going to do uh, some searches in various data catalogs and collect the results in a collection and in the end uh, publish it to, to, get, uh, to assign it to the collection at DUI uh, for easy citation. I will now switch to a screencast. So I will now start the screencast. It will take about six minutes. Yes, there should be sound. Can you not hear the sound? No. <laughs> okay, then I will just explain. Uh, I will do the voiceover uh, in real time. So we've just opened the s and uh, repository. We've switched to English, and now we're going to search for Germanic languages. Um, you will get uh, a list of results. Uh, here you can click on the documentation of the Kutnish uh, language. This will show the details, and there is a button where you can add the result to, to a virtual collection. So we're going to click it. The resource will be added to a shopping basket, and you can add multiple resources if you want. Uh, from the shopping basket, you can submit the resource to the virtual collection registry. As you can see, we are not authenticated at the moment, so we have to authenticate first. Uh, you will be redirected to the, identi to the discovery service. We will select the identity provider and provide our credentials. You can now see that we are authenticated. There's a short summary of the information that was submitted. And in this case, we're going to create a new collection. Uh, we can change all the information, all the metadata that's required for the collection. So we have to fill everything in. It's the name, uh, we'll provide a description, a collection of uh, various Germanic resources in this case. Uh, 
Um, you can provide keywords. Um, I will remove uh, the default author and add my own uh, information, my own details. As you can see, the resource that was found in SMD repository is in the collection. I'm going to save the collection. At this uh, moment, you can see that the collection is in the list of, of private collect of your, of your own collections. It's currently in the private state. This means that it's not publicly accessible at the moment. Now we're going to add another resource from the Archie repository. In this case, we are going to search for the Diauma uh, data, the Diauma collection. Oh, I paused the video, sorry. So we're going to click on the result. And as you can see here, there's also a button where you can add the results to a virtual collection. So we're going to click the button and we are redirected back to the virtual collection registry again. We're still authenticated. And again, there's a summary of the submission. We're not going to add uh, a new collection now, but we're going to merge the submission with an existing collection. So we can select the collection on the right side and click on the merge uh, into the collection. And as you can see, uh, th there's now two resources in the collection. We're going to save again. And we're going to add some more resources. In this case, we're going to use the virtual language observatory. We're going to search for Germanic and Swedish resources. And we're going to um, filter more and select the German uh, resources only. There's two results. And we can use the search options uh, to add all these results to the virtual collection registry. And we proceed. So the resources are submitted again to the virtual collection registry. As you can see, there's now two resources. We're going to merge these. Uh, again into the same collection uh, and as you can see uh, there's now four resources in this collection we're saving the collection again okay uh, another possibility so instead of uh, adding resources directly from third-party data catalogs, you can also manually add uh, any resources that any resource that is relevant. In this case, we're going to add the, uh, a link to the Wikipedia page, page on Germanic languages. And by doing so, that basically basically concludes uh, all the resources that we, that we want to add to, to this collection. By using this approach, you can basically add any link uh, that you prefer to the collection. And after saving, the collection basically is finished. We can open the collection and we can see that all the uh, resources are there. It's still private, so it's not publicly accessible. Um, so if you click the publish this collection button, it will be made public. It will uh, get assigned uh, UI. Uh, for this demonstration, I did not click the publish uh, button since this was the production instance of the virtual collection registry. And we don't want to mint too many uh, handles and DUIs for demonstration purposes only. If you look at the list of public collections, you can see that if you open a collection, that it has a DUI and a handle. There's also the option to download uh, any public collection with the CMDI Explorer. And if you click that button, you will submit the collection to the CMDI Explorer 
Uh, and that's basically the end of the screencast, because that's what Klaus is going to explain as well. Um, so basically, to conclude, with the virtual collection registry and virtual collections in general, um, we support a number of use cases. It has the, the, the basic use case where uh, you just create a collection on a specific topic that you're interested in. Uh, you can dis use this collection and cite this collection in your own publications. You can use this, for example, to collect relevant training material and, and, and offer uh, this material in, in, in your lectures to your stu students. Uh, basically, uh, anything, any, uh, any use case of any, any purpose that you, that, that you come up with uh, fit, fit, fits in here. Another use case that, that, that was uh, taken up within the shock project is was creating this neutral ground across repositories. So we worked on the integration with, with various external data repositories and implemented this approach where you can save the search results from these data repositories in a, in a single collection. Um, and there's also the use case where you could use collections as input for workflows, for example, uh, by using the switchboard integration and use the, the, the collection to do some processing on the, on the, on the resources it, it refers to, or you can use uh, the, the CMDI Explorer to download the collection and use it in a workflow that, you, that you're running locally or upload into a workflow engine manually. So thank you for your attention. There are some relevant links here. It's the main uh, location of the virtual collection registry. There's the GitHub repository where you can find the source code and report any issues if you find anything. And probably most importantly, there's the integration instructions. So if you uh, have a data repository where you would like to, to get uh, support for virtual collections, um, this is the documentation you need to, to, to um, find out what, what's actually required uh, on, on the implementation side. Thank you for your attention. So, thank you, Willem. The next presenter uh, will be Klaus Chin from uh, Tübingen University. And Klaus will uh, present the switchboard. Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah. You see my slides. Okay, so uh, let's start. So uh, in Willem's uh, demo or screen, uh, screencast, uh, you've seen um, the VCR and how it has been integrated with a number of uh, different repositories from different uh, data domains so that users from those repository sites have easy access to the VCR to easily create and uh, work with virtual collections. Wilhelm also briefly uh, referred to Cindy Explorer for the downloading capability of uh, the VCR. Um, in my presentation, I'd like to expand on that, um, uh, also with a number uh, of other tools. So uh, let me first mention the tools of interest uh, for the shock community and which I will use in my, in my demo. First, of course, the, the Virtual Language Observatory that we've uh, briefly seen. Uh, it catalogs over one million language-related resources. It can be searched via a combination of uh, faceted and full-text search, uh, and it gives you free access to the metadata. And sometimes, if the resource is uh, public, you get easy access uh, to the actual research data. Then there is the VCR, which I've already demonstrated. Um, and the download capability that I will show you uh, in a minute. And uh, Willem also mentioned the language resource switchboard. That is a tool where users can process a given resource with applicable tools. It's a kind of broker between resources. 
and tools that can process uh, process these resources in one way or another. Uh, and there's Webly's batch, uh, in case where you um, would like to uh, batch process uh, a collection of homogeneous resources um, rather than processing um, um, the uh, collection one by one, uh, you would like to use um, Webly's batch for that, uh, Numen and Omen, uh, a tool that can batch process uh, such sets of resources. Both in the Explorer, the download capability of uh, the VCR, and Webly's batch have been um, implemented uh, in the SHOT project. Okay, so um, let me briefly uh, point out the interoperability aspect uh, of this tool set. Uh, well, I showed you how the VCR is connected to a number of different repositories uh, sites in the SSH community. The same holds, uh, in fact, for the language resource uh, switchboard, which, for instance, is available from b 2 uh, Cloud Space, uh, from UDAT, which is open to all uh, European researchers. Um, the switchboard is also available from the Partners uh, Virtual Research Environment, which is an instantiation of the d4science.org platform. If you have resources for there, um, you can invoke the switchboard to get them processed. And hence, you get easy access to uh, dozens of tools that can process your resource. Uh, but the switchboard is also available from the VCR for individual resources of a collection. Uh, the switchboard is invocable from the Virtual Language Observatory. You can invoke the switchboard um, from uh, Simd Explorer for individual resources, uh, which I will show you in a minute. Um, if you have selected uh, while working through your collection, you can invoke this batch directly um, on that set of resources. Uh, but you could also go via the switchboard that knows that a zip archive of homogeneous resources can be processed by Simd. Uh, Explorer, uh, so it proposed that tool uh, for that task. Um, Sim the Explorer is, of course, metadata. Uh, an example that I will show in the demo is the integration of Sim the Explorer with uh, Talara, that is our. Uh, language archive uh, at the University of Tübingen. Um, with interoperability by design, it is easy for shop parties to take part in this infrastructure and to profit from it. So SSH repositories, they can provide the metadata uh, to the VLO, uh, Europeana, um, part of SESTA, for instance, provides a few thousand uh, resources to the VLO, which has been a great addition uh, to the uh, virtual language observatory. Um, if you have a repository, then you can offer your users direct access to the switchboard. Only a few lines of JavaScript are needed to get this realized. In a similar manner, via the HTTP protocol, you can give your repository users easy access to the VCR uh, and to SIMD Explorer. Um, and of course, if you have a tool, uh, you can integrate it um, with the switchboard. Um, for those integration, design rational has always been made easy. Uh, we have spent many uh, hours in discussion with our community, and perhaps when you can offer uh, in terms of feasibility, with small investments uh, required only. Um, so here's a usage scenario for the demo uh, I'm going to do. I will focus on the um, on the processing part. Willem has showed you how to uh, find resources and uh, construct virtual collections, and I'm going to show you what to do once we have uh, a virtual collection. Okay, let's. Uh, um, I have to prepare a screen case, uh, a screencast. I'm going to go uh, 
jump into the danger of showing you a live demo. Um, so let's go to the browser. Um, do you see my vector EU dot? Yes. Yes? OK, great. So um, let me just briefly show, the, show you the, the drop uh, plugin. Uh, because it refers to what Dan mentioned with, uh, on his slide with the various data chains and B2 Media Server, that's a service that is open to all European researchers from all kinds of domains. So I've just logged into B2 Drop. Uh, I can really advise to use it. It gives you 20 gigabytes of free space. <laughs> so it's easy to say goodbye to Dropbox and other commercial services. Uh, you see here that there is one file uh, in my in my uh, in my cloud space, it's a text file, and I uh, I can click um, on the dot 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 button, and you see that there is a switchboard option. Uh, and now the file is being sent to the switchboard. Uh, it's a text file, um, uh, some information about Albert Einstein. Uh, so we're in the Einstein room, but in a different one. Um, and then you see that the switchboard proposes you uh, tools that can process this resource. Um, so there are parsing tools, uh, distant reading tools, um, uh, tools for named entity recognition, and so on. And uh, the unique selling point of the switchboard is it proposes you applicable tools, and at the same time, you can start the tool with a single click. So here I... Uh, I, um, I, I'm using Plicht, uh, which is a tool chain for uh, the annotation of text files. Uh, I use constituency parsing, and with a single click, I can I can process the resource. Uh, so, from my cloud space, actually obtaining results uh, uh, of an analysis is really really simple. Okay. Um, so uh, the one thing where Wilhelm's screencast ended was the virtual collection registry. Um, so this, this is, um, see if I have to, uh, no, I don't have to log in. So this is the virtual collection registry. It's, uh, it's, uh, there are some uh, private collections and those are the public collections. One collection that I created in a similar way than Wilhelm demonstrated was my short stories of English. Uh, it has been published, so it appears as a download link. Um, so if you click on this download link, uh, you are referred to SIMD Explorer. You can also look into the collection itself. It's a collection of five uh, stories. They're all in English. Uh, they're all in plain text. Um, I did it on purpose for being able to have a homogeneous uh, resource. So you see here, the, these are these five uh, items, and you can invoke uh, the switchboard. Uh, here you see the switchboard as a pop-up window, which is really nice, and that's how it also would work if you would uh, include the switchboard in your repository site. Uh, it just appears as a pop-up. So Just later items. Asking too much of the network. Klaus, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. You seem frozen. Please continue. Uh, okay. Um, so. Uh, that's, uh, that's possible um, to invoke uh, the switchboard for a single item of your collection, but let's just do the download um, download capability. So here, SIMD Explorer is being invoked. It analyzes all the metadata that describes the virtual collection um, and recursively uh, identifies uh, the actual resources the metadata describes and downloads the resources, if possible, from the respective sites. All right, so here are my five, uh, my five uh, stories uh, that I had in the virtual collection. Um, these are the five uh, 
this is five collections, and you see that each each item has the short story in different uh, formats. Uh, you can click uh, on any of the leaf items and you get uh, further information about it. So here's the HTML version uh, of the short story. Uh, you could download uh, the short story from the uh, provider of the resource. Uh, you can send it to the switchboard or to WebList batch. Um, so for instance, let's send uh, it to the switchboard. Uh, we've sent it to the switchboard. Uh, you see the short story here. And again, you could invoke the tool of your choice to, um, um, to analyze um, the resource. Um, Right, so here's distant reading uh, capabilities. Um, what you can also do is you could say, well, let's get let's get all these text files uh, that I'm interested in, um, and um, and download them. So you make a selection of uh, leaf notes, and now uh, Simda Explorer is contacting all these uh, repositories you set the actual research data and put them in a zip file. Um, you can download the zip file. Um, so here you see, um, here you see the, five, uh, the, five, um, the five resources, but uh, you can also uh, send it to, uh, for instance, to um, the switchboard. Uh, and the switchboard, for instance, was a web batch can process. Can, uh, open Webflash batch on the resources. Um, you say, okay, uh, all the resources are in English, they're all plain text, uh, and I want to do um, linked entity uh, recognition for the resource, then you start uh, the processing. Now now we have sent a set of resources uh, to Webflash batch. Webflash batch is going to, going to process each resource one by one and gives, uh, puts all the individual results into a zip file um, that you can download. All right, so that uh, that might take a while um, to get it um, to get it uh, processed, and um, maybe in the meantime, I can show you also um, another integration that done in the shock project that's uh, a prototypical uh, presentation which again shows you uh, how the switchboard could be used um, uh, um, from uh, from a repository site here is uh, the database or the repository of the german archaeological society where you can just uh, for instance uh, mark uh, a text item uh, with your browser and then you can, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, invoke a tool, for instance, Wikipedia. So we mark uh, Leo the 10th, so we can open Wikipedia, and then you get all the hits of Wikipedia uh, from, from, uh, from this person, and you can uh, look this person up. Okay, so uh, let's go back to our job. It's finished now, um, uh, the five, the five uh, items have been processed. We can download the results uh, as a zip file. Zip file is uh, is as, is a, is five uh, files uh, of, uh, containing the results uh, of processing. Okay, I think that that would uh, conclude my presentation. Just one um, one short. Um, um, I think that um, it might add to our discussion at the end of the session. Uh, it all looks nice in the demo, uh, and it actually works nicely, but still, uh, for instance, we have uh, to cope with uh, authentication uh, issues across data domains. That's certainly an issue for the future to, uh, to be tackled. And of course, uh, having different metadata standards across different data domains uh, is a problem, and the tools that I showed you at the moment only work with CMDI. Uh, so that's certainly also a point of discussion for for later on, maybe. And uh, that concludes my my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. <laughs> and indeed, I hope that uh, one or two of your 
questions uh, can be discussed later on. Next topic is the academic uh, vocabulary comments uh, by Matej Durko, who has already had a few exposures today, but one other Yeah, so, um, oh. yeah, to conclude the session, I try to be short. Um, on the topic of interoperability, uh, one aspect that is obvious and uh, kind of on the, on the more maybe semantic level, uh, rather than maybe the previous what we saw was uh, infrastructural technical uh, integrations. Uh, and what I like to think about uh, vocabularies as is, is the semantic glue or, or the semantic bridges. So, so the means that you can use to uh, uh, bring together data sets or, or um, scopes from different projects and different domains, uh, basically to make them talk to each other in, uh, or understand each other. Uh, and vocabularies would be the mean for that, ideally. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so within the shock project, uh, we uh, addressed this issue in. Oh, I see them there. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, th th there was this interest on uh, working with on the common working together on the vocabularies from all the all the research infrastructures involved, um, uh, with the idea um, based on the idea that that vocabularies. We should work on them together, or we could could help us reuse or, or bring together data sets uh, to collaboratively use these vocabularies and manage them, um, and also to um, promote them to first class citizens, if you wish, uh, in in the data space, um, make them uh, the fair as well. Um, uh, these ideas are summarized in the Commons uh, vocabulary Commons Charter. Um, and even though it wasn't initially uh, as a key exploitation result in the shock project, we identified this, this need, uh, and, and there was a number of activities in scope of work package three, and um, also especially got, uh, pushed by the Clarin research infrastructure uh, or Clarin vocabulary initiative to, yeah, to have meetings, to have exchange on, on this topic. Um, And uh, let's see, yeah, so, so what, what do we want to achieve here uh, in the vocabulary commons? What is it, a initiative, probably, <laughs> is the best? It's, it's, it, yeah. it's initiative, but it also already has uh, bear some fruits, uh, or there were some activities, tangible and, and outcomes. Uh, so what we aim to, and what we actually already do, is operating a common vocabulary repository, uh, which would be a place to publish the, the vocabularies as a precondition for uh, simplifying the reuse. Um, what, um, yeah, and another, in the sense of, of fair, uh, you want to make the vocabularies findable, um, discoverable, um, and, uh, and I will come later to that as well, uh, in more detail, you want to also be able to dig deeper into, so not just the metadata, not just description, okay, there is a vocabulary, but what is in the vocabulary in, in it uh, without having to go for each of them, so that would be under the umbrella of federated search over the vocabularies. Um, um, then the question of the evolution of vocabularies and how can we come to an agreement on uh, how to version vocabularies. Um, uh, and on the technical level, because the vocabulary is only, or yeah, mainly are become useful really when they are integrated into some third party applications, in the, in the actual applications where database is being created, where I can use the vocabulary as, so to say, autocomplete, right? So for the, from the point of view of the user, uh, I want to have the vocabulary in my authoring uh, form uh, when I create the, the data or metadata. Um, and for that, we need the API standardization so that the tools can easily access these vocabularies uh, uh, in a machine processable way. And obviously, this all needs um, exchange discussion between the all involved parties. Um, this is uh, the one tangible result. So this is the vocabulary commons, how do we call it? Okay, okay. 
the, the rep well, the repository for the, for the vocab platform. the publication platform, the, vocab the, the repository for the vocabulary commons um, initiative where currently the uh, vocabularies that were used or created uh, within a shock project are hosted. Uh, technically, it's a Scosmos instance, so Scosmos is a PHP-based, I hope PHP-based application <laughs> uh, with a triple star behind it, uh, and uh, actually ACDHCH, so the, my institute, is um, proudly hosting it on behalf of uh, the research infrastructures. Um, oh. Oh, I didn't, <laughs> I see, I didn't, we actually, but we actually updated, uh, it, it's live, it's updated already. So because I saw that we missed uh, CESTA in the partners, but CESTA is obviously also a partner. And in the real, when you go to the link, you actually will, I just forgot to update the screenshot, sorry. Uh, so it's uh, all mentioned about uh, who are involved there. Um, yeah, um, please visit uh, and have a look. So it allows you to navigate and search in all these uh, vocabulary. So while you're in, in such one instance, uh, all, already this deep search is possible, uh, but uh, where it becomes you know, more challenging uh, is, okay, there, there won't be one vocabulary platform. Uh, so there are already many and there will be more probably, and they have all their justification. Uh, but again, the user would want to, you want the user to be able to look through or search through all these in a simple manner and don't have to go to each of them separately and, and search for, uh, through each separately. And uh, not just searching over the metadata, so a short description of the vocabulary, but even but search in the, in the terms. So that would be this content search or federated search, um, where in one place I can look for concepts available in those vocabularies or find vocabularies that feature concepts that may be of interest for me, right? And there are two, basically, gener generally, uh, in general, two strategies for such, such distributed systems, and that would be either the, the centralized approach, uh, where you harvest the information from all the sources and have a central index where you can easily provide search faceting and so on, so it's efficient uh, for on the point of on, uh, in query time, or when the user access the, the information, but you have obviously the update and syncing problem. So when the vocabulary evolves at the source, you need to uh, update it, um, yeah, to provide current information. On the other, the other option would be a federated search where you leave the data where it is, and then on runtime or query time, you distribute the query, fetch the partial results from the individual parties, and try to, on the fly, bring them together and offer it to the user, which obviously has the performance problem and the problem of yeah, being rely, relying on uh, too many parties, foreign parties which you don't have under your control necessarily. Um, so we are in, uh, here in this tension and we don't have a final answer yet uh, how, to, how to solve it. Um, we are experimenting in both directions, I would say. Um, I mean, maybe one note here is that uh, Cosmos instance or, or this the vocabulary repository or the underlying Cosmos instance is actually relying in the background on, well, obviously this cost model, uh, which is a, um, uh, in the realm of linked open data and RDF. And so you, and actually in the background, Sparkle is being used to, to do the queries and Sparkle has inbuilt, uh, Sparkle is, or RDF is built for a distributed world or is meant as a distributed system. Um, and Sparkle itself also natively supports distributed queries uh, theoretically or also practically, but again, the performance problem. So we know that it doesn't really, or the experience is that it doesn't really scale, unfortunately. So we'll see. Um, and what I, one more thing I would like to add here on another topic. I mean, I started at the beginning, so the using of the, or using and reusing uh, of the vocabularies is one aspect. And the other is, uh, but the other would be the, the management, so the evolution of the vocabularies, right? So if you don't assume a vocabulary to be stable and fixed, uh, but actually you want to add concepts, you may want to have, uh, add new definitions and, and so on. So the, so the curation or the active yeah, evolution of vocabularies and how to, and that is one, I would argue, solve when you have the vocabulary under your control, when it's in your, so there are, 
nice tools for editing vocabularies while, uh, while you are in kind of one organizational context. Uh, but what about, and, but we want, in this vocabulary commons idea, we want to go beyond that. We want to reuse vocabularies across multiple con scopes or contexts. And there you have the problem of, well, there you enter into various complications. Uh, I think probably the major one being underlying is the question of the ownership. So who has the say? Who can still decide if a new concepts will be added or something changed? What is when the new version should be uh, deployed and so on? So the authority, especially in the distributed uh, setup and, uh, uh, where you have a loose coupling, so to say. So you nece don't necessarily work in one project, uh, but somebody, another team wants to reuse your vocabulary but would want to evolve it and, and so what is the feedback loop? So would you, the, the two parties have to agree, the original one and the new one or um, how to deal with that? I mean the easy, easy way out is to just do a copy and then work on that copy but that we actually want to, I mean there's also one option but maybe in some cases it would be nicer to keep one vocabulary and evolve it together to work, so, yeah. Uh, but with these complications of who decides. Uh, also on the technical and organizational level you have, you have to have appropriate procedures uh, for, for agreement and for the evolution. Um, and yeah, I already mentioned it a bit, is this question of the, on the technical level, the synchronization with the applications where these vocabularies are being used. So ideally, my experience is that the user won't, doesn't really care, the, the original user of the vocabulary that, or doesn't really care about the vocabulary being published, they want to use it in their application and also maybe want to add a new concept when, while they are in their actual data set, right? So it's like a secondary thing that you want to add there. Uh, and how, that, how to synchronize uh, these two process processes. So the one is a uh, quick uh, addition to a vocabulary while I'm doing a different work and the other is the actual systematic evolution of the vocabulary. So I, I don't have an answer for this. Uh, so this is a challenge too. And I think that, yeah, uh, concludes my part. Okay, thank you, Matej. And well, we still have ample time for a discussion. Um, of course, it's, uh, ch it's um, seductive to talk about the, la the, the, the last presentation, but I hope there are also uh, questions about the, the earlier presentations. Let me first go to our online. There are no, um, okay. Then it's up to you. Who wants to start? Yes, please. Thanks, so I'm uh, Laura Morales, I'm a professor of comparative politics and I'm uh, part of a, a work package nine on data communities. Um, all of the presentations were really interesting, uh, thank you very much. Um, my questions are primarily for um, uh, Willem, um, uh, fundamentally. I, I do find the virtual collection tool uh, as a concept and idea really very appealing. Uh, even for me as a social scientist, I do work uh, sometimes with uh, um, language and, and text data from uh, a kind of parliamentary uh, sources, so primarily uh, speeches in, in parliament by um, members of parliament, by legislation, legislators, but also other types of interventions. Um, but one of the limitations that I found, and I don't know if this is in the plans, uh, is actually that it seems that creating the data collection requires that you're getting the data or some of the sources from somewhere where it's already properly stored um, and documented and includes metadata. Whereas in my particular individual situation, a lot of the times what you have is a mix of uh, uh, types of data, some which are you are creating yourself from scratch, from for example, PDF files or uh, from uh, uh, a request that you directly met, made to the kind of parliamentary uh, 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 IT services to get the data in certain shapes and then you add yourself uh, metadata and additional variables to describe uh, uh, the different MPs. Uh, so I I'm wondering whether already the tool uh, allows for including 
sources uh, that you are generating yourself as a researcher in one way or another and that don't include uh, 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 already this metadata, but you can actually add them yourself. So with that would require you depositing, depositing the data uh, uh, somewhere like a Dataverse uh, self-repository. Um, and, and what are the, the plans? As, and that's my first part of the question. So in the second part of the question is whether you have actually thought about, because it, it seems to me that universities all over uh, uh, the world are creating their uh, uh, um, self-deposit repositories um, and kind of library data archives, so to speak. Um, and I don't think that that is integrated yet. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you have a strategy to reach out uh, to the research libraries and to all of those data verses that are out there to make them also interoperable with the uh, virtual collection. But it's really a fascinating project and I really look forward to how it develops. Thanks. B Willem, will you go first? <laughs> then, <laughs> then I can <laughs> jump also. Uh, yes. Uh, Th thank you for your, for your question and your remarks. Um, yeah, I think your first question about support for depositing data into the virtual collection registry, um, I, I, that has been a clear design decision for the virtual collections and for the virtual collection registry to not support direct uh, depositing of, of, of data into the tool. So you would always need to find somewhere to, to, to deposit your data indeed, uh, be it uh, uh, a university data repository or, uh, or, or something more uh, uh, persistent. But yeah, you would have to deposit your, your, your data somewhere. But yeah, that does tie into your second question. Um, if you deposit your data in, in a location where it is accessible via a, a, a URL, you can always manually add it to a collection. Um, and yeah, there is the effort on, on, on our side to um, try to create as many integrations with external data catalogs as possible. Within the shock project, we now have achieved three, so that's a start, but yeah, there's uh, lots more to do. Okay, um, yeah, I could add to that. Uh, that uh, we have indeed seen that uh, thing. And I think we only spoke about that, Willem, two weeks ago when we were preparing uh, this uh, session <laughs> about, uh, because you're not the only one who, who makes that mistake. Some people think it's, uh, if they make an, let's say, an, an, an link to a resource, that the resource get copied somewhere, for instance. And that's, mm, that was not the intention there. So there are solutions there. I mean, there are, as you say, uh, free to use uh, storage. Uh, but you also have to think a bit about the persistency of the virtual collection that you create. Hmm? So if what you, as you suggest, if you, we do, um, it, it sounds a bit like um, semantic annotation. Yeah? If you have a web browser, web annotation. You have a web browser, you find things, you annotate them. And they have to be uh, preserved there um, in, in the form where they, where they were. Um, yeah, it, th that was obviously not, not our intention. But I think it would be possible to, for instance, uh, facilitate, and uh, let's say, integrate it with a free to use or easy to use uh, storage, uh, which also provides a persistent identifier then to link in the uh, virtual collection. Uh, not coming up quite to what you mean with web annotation, but at least addressing the point that uh, you want to save the things that you refer to. Is this okay? Yeah. Any other? Sorry? I don't understand. Yeah, I. Ah, yeah, Klaus, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, oh, okay. ah, you have a hand. I see, it's, it's quite, <laughs> a, quite a small hand. <laughs> Sorry. I can, I can do that here. Uh, no, just to add to that, uh, I, mean, I would not even call it a workaround, but of course you could upload your resource to B2Drop that I showed you in my demonstration. Uh, and B2Drop, you get, you get a shared link 
which is which is something that you could use uh, for the VCR. Uh, but of course, Dan's and Willem's comments that it should be more or less a persistent collection. I, if if it is a persistent collection, and if you want to publish it, I mean, if for private collections, maybe the beta drop solution is is is, is uh, nice enough. You could always propagate your resource from P2 drop to P2 share. Um, and then you get a PID, and then you could use it uh, with the VCR easily. And that's something that you can do um, uh, quite quickly. Um, ju just a comment on that, yeah. Yeah, well, I, will I, I would consider B2 drop or B2 share such an easy to use uh, storage uh, facility. Okay, um, more questions. Oh, there is some, somebody online. Yeah, one, one, one short remark on, on what has been said so far. So for, for the virtual collections by itself, it's not a hard requirement that your resource, uh, that you can refer to it by uh, via a persistent identifier. Uh, in, 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 in practice, a URL is fine. But the question about persistency of the, the thing that you link to in, from your virtual collection is, is an important consideration to take into account. Um, and one of the things that is on the uh, on the roadmap uh, uh, at some point is to do some periodic analysis of the links in the virtual collections and see if there are broken links or not, and then also uh, somehow indicate that in the uh, in, in in the collection. Okay, now the question online. Yeah, we have a question online. It says the CMDI Explorer and Switchboard integration is only good if you have a metadata file. These are usually either in a cat catalog system such as Clarins, VLO, or in a repository. What are your plans in e integrating such tools into repositories or catalog systems? Well, the more the better, I would say. Um, within the shop project, we uh, well, you, you've seen the integrations that we have mostly uh, done within uh, within shock time uh, more uh, repositories uh, yes please uh, everybody is welcome there um, was that did i answer now the complete question uh, can you i think so and there yeah. are integration mm, instructions i think willem you mentioned them in your presentation yes. right and they are pretty good if you're a developer So there's not nothing stopping integration of uh, the VCR. No. And just to add to that, um, I didn't show it in my demo, but uh, I had it on the slide. So there is an integration of Cindy Explorer from Talara, our, our uh, tubing and repository for language related resources. So when you when you browse the Talara repository, there's a link to Cindy Explorer where you can then uh, view the metadata in Simd Explorer and download um, the resources that you're interested in. So that's uh, that's one repository where Simd Explorer is is integrated, and it's a really easy integration because it's really just a, an HTTP, HTTP call to Simd Explorer where all the necessary information for Simd Explorer is passed as a URL parameter. So it's 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 easy to do. Okay, more? Yeah, Matt. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Matt Fleun from uh, EGI Foundation. It's uh, not really a, a question, more of a comment, but we've seen some very interesting, good technical work here uh, to enable interoperability, but I feel it's not the only thing that should be done to make it a reality. I'm thinking particularly the policy uh, should be there in, uh, as well. For example, have a look at um, preservation of data. We've always known that this is an important thing to think about, but it was only when the Commission required that uh, DMPs, data management plans, should be there that people really started taking attention and doing. Maybe something similar could be done to help interoperability at the policy yeah. level. But now, now, you, uh, I, now I have the idea we are confusing two things. Your, com your comment is correct, by the way. No, no problem with that. But I mean, Originally, the VCR was there for, uh, how do you say, to, to be integrated in the repository systems. These repository systems are certified. Uh, 
trusted uh, centers uh, there. There is no problem with, let's say, have, having plans uh, to, to make that data sustainable there. The other thing is what uh, Laura mentioned there. She wants to make data that is, how do you say, not registered at least, but, well, uh, but or use a mix. Or use a, use a mix there. Huh? So then you somehow have to look for a sustainable solutions for that coincidental data that Laura meets in her, in her browsing. I would say that that's a bit of a different problem with respect to uh, a data management plan, for instance. But would you, wouldn't you agree? Or I would. I think there are some similarities. I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Well, I say, I say, yeah. Okay. So Andreas Petzold from the um, Henry Fair project. So we are a guest from the environmental um, cluster. And uh, one problem we have in our cluster with the data interoperability is the question of licenses. How did you solve that? Or did you solve it with it giving licenses to all the data and metadata systems to make them interoperable and machine actionable? Um, I think it's solved within the individual stakeholders uh, there. So Clarin has its own system uh, there. Um, but over, of, overall, it's a kind of assumption that the metadata is free. And what's mostly in there is metadata, of course. Yeah? It's, not, it's not the resources themselves. So... Um, common creative licenses, most likely. Oh, sorry. You use common creative licenses, most likely, to make them publicly accessible and open. Yeah, to be sure, I, I, I'm not sure. I know the metadata is open. That That's for me uh, sufficient. And I know that the data is available under different licenses depending on what's the type of data. But maybe Mari wants to. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, so in, in SESTA, we, we're struggling a bit with this. So usually we have a license attached to the data, but very often there is no explicit license on the metadata. And given that we have data that goes back decades, we cannot assert a license on these because we no longer have the means to ask the people to consent to asserting licenses. Those metadata descriptions back then were made in the intention that there is a, uh, what do you call them, the, the little uh, paper cards that are in the physical catalogs in the drawer somewhere in the basement in the archive. Yeah. Um, general understanding is today that Online catalogs replace these. Everyone agrees with that principle, and we're working under the assumption that um, they'll be fine with it. They're not going to come and sue us that we're making the research they did accessible. Um, but we can't assert a license because that would be a legal thing that we can't do. In, in a way, we're taking a risk that we're distributing it without a license, but it's the best we can do, and we think it's what everyone expects to happen. Well, that would be asserting that there is no copyright that someone claims, and we can't do that for someone that's not ourselves. Yes, yeah, sorry, and if I may add, I, I think one, uh, the, the other thing is how to describe that all that information about licenses, access rights, so that the machine can uh, act on it. So that's also something that's totally, I, I would say totally missing at the moment. Uh, and also, uh, when we're working, we're, describing the solutions for the conversion hub, one of the findings was that uh, there are, I mean, there are a lot of solutions the individual researchers have come up with, for example, mappings, but there's no information on who is the author, the creator, what is, what is the license, or, or how can you use this? So a lot of work to be done. Yes, thank you. And I got just a signal that we have reached the, uh, the life, <laughs> end of life, uh, of this <laughs> of this session, so I want to thank you all very much for uh, being here and asking questions, uh, and I hope to see you uh, during the uh, conference and talk to you. Thank you very much.